selling much of any of it yet. Um, no, my, my main reason was to, because I, I started with the larger form factor printer. So yep. that meant I, I needed a larger bucket OIPA and, you know, having to, you know, basically dump and, and replenish that thing. I'm like, yeah, no, this, this would be a huge, you know, regular cost. What can I do to, you know, stretch it? for lack of a better term. So I've, I've since moved to a two-stage wash where I, I really don't care how dirty the first one gets as long as stuff is coming off. Um, and then the, the, the second one is a much, much cleaner. Yeah, so you're not burning through, you know. No. I don't no, know. You're I'm not, through, I'm you not know, doing a week kind of thing. No, no, I'm not doing anywhere near that that sort of scale. Um, I, I got a buddy who does a bunch of pre-supporting work that also runs an Etsy store. Um, so every every model that he pre-supports, he test prints to you know to validate that hey, it it, it Etsy store that he'll sell stuff through. Um, he goes through a fair bit. Uh, I've been trying to get him to, to give the, uh, the alum powder and then salting it a go to, to see how many additional uses that he could get out of the IPA. Cause it's not really that much more in the way of like people time work. So I'm like, yeah, it's machine time. It's... La- exactly. It's like, you're not adding much to labor time here. Give it a try. See what happens. I mean, overall delivery time you are, but again, that's, that's not of the particular concern there. That's, that's what you pay for that premium. If you want that by tomorrow, you know, you're going to pay for that product. to get. Well, to and I mean, tomorrow, on top so. of that, if, if you're doing that quantity of printing, it is nothing to have basically, you know, three batches worth of, of IPA. So you, you're using one and then you have the other two are in the different stages and you, you just move it one stage each time the, it gets too dirty, the one that's in use. Yeah. Yeah. And you just leave it. Leave so, it I mean, yeah, you, you do have that initial buildup, but to, to be honest, most people that haven't gone down this path end up with a massive buildup to begin with anyways. So, eh. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a little different. Mm-hmm. Hey, Brian, how's it going, man? Hey, good, and you? Good. Hey, Brian. Hey, Chris. What's happening? Oh, I wanted to know some more details on on resin with our resident expert chris over yeah so I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I just i just constantly ask resin resin questions it, again it's it is a um you know it, it is a different animal oh yeah just, are you dabbling you know, with yours i've been yeah i've been um like we talked last week on getting the alcohol to a higher proof i've been you know trying yeah. to play play around with um I haven't done that yet, but utilize the the resins for thing, uh, you know, products mm-hmm. of just just in general sorts, because it, it's just kind of like occurring to me as of late that all this the ultimate problem with printing, as we know, is it's 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 just a challenge for regular people to use. There's a lot mm-hmm. of things that are not automated yet. We've we've talked endless on that. So the next step is you use it for your rapid prototyping. We're already here. That's just getting bigger, better, faster, stronger, more efficient in all the other areas, so on and so forth. But the real challenge there is if you want that product actually made, how can you get it at volume super quickly in a localized manner? And that seems, mm-hmm. seems like the next, next challenge, um, at, at least for like just the end result, because nobody really cares if something is 3D printed or not, right? The, the less mm-hmm. layer lines, the better. That's why people like resin more, but we know what at, at cost that it comes at. So the, the end of the day question is, if I want something, can I get it today? And if it 
if I like it, can I get a hundred of them by tomorrow? Yeah. Right. Like that's yeah. like the ultimate. Whoa. Okay. That's cool. So can you, Which, use I mean, a, you know, it, it, it all depends on, you know, your, your dimensions of your parts, but I mean, you know, if you're printing, Oh, I need a hundred of this thing. That's only, you know, a, a couple centimeters, you know, cubed in dimension, regardless what the actual shape is like, yeah, that that's, that's doable with a couple of resin printers. I mean, it, 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 it all depends on, you know, Oh no, I, I need this one part and it's this by this, by this. I'm like, okay, that's a little bit bigger. Um, let's see how we have to angle this thing to. Yeah. They fit three of these. Um, yeah, this is going to take a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's fascinating as a, as you mm -hmm. think, you know, what, once you do get something, can you get out a thousand of them that, that quickly? And what is the yep. best manufacturing application yep. know, to, to do so? But I was, but you said it before, and I know other people have said, said this to me too. Um, you know, like your curing spot is your last spot. So mm -hmm. you pro you're probably adding, and, and again, it's all machine time, but you're probably adding an additional, we'll just make it up 50% to the overall print time in both the pre and post processing versus F, you know, FDM, you're maybe adding, we'll just say 10%, um, you know, for, that's why I will say 20% for 10% before leveling the bed and, mm -hmm. you know, peeling off your supports, you know, afterwards, um, mm -hmm. you know, but it seems like there's a little bit more, you know, pre and post, pre and post on resin. But it, like you said, if somebody um, is going to, pay 80 or 90 dollars for that small little piece mm -hmm. it's worth it to do you know a test print or two test prints and wait 36 hours you know you know because that's what they want it's just a one-off so mm -hmm. it's, yeah it's it, it's fascinating per application process yeah. rather than just strictly fdm or, or just strictly resin like there's ways yeah to get i mean to... if, if you're really looking more towards like that you know, hundreds to low thousands volume r really is something more like a soyo cast where, where it's doing the silicone mold, but it's actual injection molding still. Yeah. Sorry, I froze, froze it for a second. Yeah, the, the, um, you still need to use the regular processes that we've always had, but, um, it'll well, get faster. I mean, they, 3D printing will get faster, you know, over time and more distributed in, in like medium mm -hmm. senses, but you know, there's, there's always a place for, you know, an injection molded process or a, mm -hmm. a lathe, you know, or, you know, something being machined, um, at, yeah. that, at that stage, cause it's just a cheaper option. Well, it's, it's definitely, it is, it is lower, it is lower cost per unit. You just have to hit a certain minimum unit count to make it feasible economically. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Did you guys print mm. anything this week or busy week? I actually, I actually didn't print anything this week. I've, I've done a fair bit of renovation on, on the home office. Uh, I've, I've done some painting on a couple of minis I already had printed out, but no new printing this week. Yeah, no, me either. Um, it's been busy, but uh, I sold the motorcycle. Cool. Oh, nice. And uh, then we put a new furnace and a new air conditioner in. Ooh. <laughs> oh man right at the worst time too yeah it kind of kind of was flaking out there oh um, but man they were they were right here the next day and mm -hmm. i signed the paperwork the day after that and they came out the next day and put it in yeah wow that's really nice and that's a that's a How, great uh, pro process yeah. How old was your furnace that they replaced? The furnace, I think, was 
20 and the air was like 17 or vice versa. Okay. I don't, I don't well, know. I mean, you, you got a good life out of both of those units oh, at yeah. least. And yeah. your heating bill, you should definitely notice a difference come winter with that new one. That should be a lot higher efficiency. Yeah. Yes, it definitely, uh, it's definitely quieter when it runs. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah, I know with uh, with my mother, she had to have her replaced a couple of years ago. And like she asked, she she called me up and asked, like, well, which one should I get? I'm like, okay, go with the 97% efficient. It's not that much more when you buy the unit and you'll get the money back if you ever sell the house. Yeah. And she was going for something. Now, mind you, it was a train. So it was a good furnace, but it was like oh, yeah. from the 80s. I'm like yeah you're you're gonna see a hell of a lower gas bill because this thing's actually efficient now <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it should make should make a big difference mm -hmm. you know over the next couple of years yeah you know what uh then uh i put a new steering wheel on the mustang and a new uh support bar in the engine bay and mm -hmm. so I, i've been busy but yeah i haven't printed anything mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll really yeah, feel it, the, you'll really feel that cool, um, whatever the AC is rated at. We were just talking about that with the mm -hmm. other machines, um, or I'm sorry, with the other houses, for all the old, all the AC units, how old they are and where, where everything is at. And then we're doing something at the Masonic building, um, same, same thing, and the guy put in a cheaper model, but uh, we needed a little bit more expensive only because mm -hmm. exactly what you, you just said right there this is more of a commercial area and mm -hmm. it's better value down the line um mm -hmm. we we literally just had the other one recharged i think today or yesterday and it took whatever the units come out to i don't know what the measurements are of freon but mm -hmm. it takes they're only legally allowed to give one unit of freon per machine but this older unit that we have is taking three so mm -hmm. it, it, it you know there was a roundabout way we got you know a full unit yeah. instead of only a third and three different trips so um yeah. it's like wow that is uh, uh you know even tighter restrictions over the next 10 years get something that's more efficient a little bit better mm -hmm. so when regulations do finally get up to that higher standard you know you're you're at that baseline so you yep. pay a little bit more now but you have it you have it on the back end it just it really really helps because then you look at it exactly what you just said brian you know the same thing for ours you know you're at year 25 or you're at year 18 on these machines and it's like yep. wow that that's awesome you know you could depreciate that out over a you know a 10 or 15 year plan right to budget oh, yeah. for a new one mm-hmm Yep. And the wife's happy, so you know. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> yeah, important. Keep it. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> yeah. 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 Make sure. Make sure mm -hmm. you're on the good side. <laughs> you don't want to be yeah. in the doghouse. Yeah. Yeah. The the last thing I need to do uh for my mother's house as far as uh, for resale value is I'm looking into having them do the uh the foam insulation where they drill the hole in between each oh. wall space yeah from oh the inside because her yeah. the the exterior walls are absolutely terribly insulated i mean this this home was built in like the late 60s and it whatever was in there has disintegrated there's like nothing left yeah so i'm like you know this this is the only way to really do it can't do it from the outside easily because it's a, a brick facade on the whole house i'm like I'm afraid of them popping a brick out because they'll crack the mortar. And then once that starts, it'll just carry further. I'm like, nope, nope. They're, they're going to go from the inside and I will deal with having holes patched and, and repainting because luckily the house was painted in the last few years. So it'd be easy enough to match with whatever's in the paint bucket. Um, but it, it doesn't look like it's that expensive. And really they should be in and out of there in like a day. Yeah. So. Well, it depends they, they on where, do that where it's from at. From the outside too. or inside. So it's they'll be doing it from the inside. So they'll basically okay. be drilling like a two-inch hole in the drywall at the top of the wall, 
every you know 18 inches so they can hit between every every, every stud yeah okay yeah so basically how those usually work only on my, my house is uh in the similar stance mm -hmm. uh, it's it's all laugh so you know there's no okay, way in this case in this case there is no laugh it is uh okay that's it, nice normal then. drywall yeah yeah so so that's nice because you can go and have a higher guarantee that you will get better insulation yeah because the problem with laugh is when they laid you know the small slits and they're pushing the concrete through you know, it piles in a different pattern, mm -hmm. you know, density as it falls, you know, behind. So when somebody goes and drills through that, exactly what you would do in that case is what you're talking about. You mm -hmm. can't guarantee that what you're filling is going to fall exactly where you want because you have no idea, you know, how many holes are you going to drill in the wall, right? To find, you know, all that concrete, maybe one section and there's none in this section, right? You know, oh my God, you're you're gonna spend tens of thousands of dollars, you know, and it, and it's still not gonna be perfect. So you're better off to exactly. For me, I have two options. I either get a bigger, you know, AC and heating unit, or I do exactly what you're saying, which again means it doesn't have the hundred percent guarantee like for your mother's house where it's all drywall. So at least mm -hmm. there you can yeah. get everything between the studs in a laugh house. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't know what's behind that laugh in every single spot and it's too expensive to figure it out. Mm -hmm. But it is a lot of work. That makes... It's worth it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I know there's uh, there's been a couple of companies advertising here locally where they'll basically do the do the installation at pretty much no cost. You you're just buying materials, which I mean that means they're making enough margin on the materials to cover their labor. I know how that works, but yeah. I'm like, hmm, all right, let's see. You know, ha have them come in, give a couple quotes. Yeah, and if it, again, you know, if if it actually helps out your your, your, you know, your mother's heating and AC bill. Mm. I mean, okay, it's it was worth it because you only have to do that once. Yep. Well, that and that's that's something that's easily recoupable if we ever go to sell the house too. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what most people don't realize. All that stuff is baked in. Yep. You know, baked into the price as it is. You put in a new driveway. It's a twenty thousand dollar driveway. Okay, guess what? The house just increased by twenty thousand at that particular mm -hmm. point That's yeah just how it just how it goes yep and my, my panel and stuff i was kind of surprised for how long my panel took mm. to to come in it was supposed to be a 400 amp panel but it ended up mm -hmm. only being a 200 yeah it only ended up being 200 because 400 were backed up up until uh, well, I think it was like the end of December or next January, or if I wanted mm -hmm. it a little bit quicker, it would come from uh, Japan, which means it has yep. to go through the uh, the CE certification, yep, so on and so forth, and that's like a six month process. So it was the same. It was like basically a year out for both options. Mm -hmm. But whatever you put into that, you know, a hundred amp panel versus a two hundred amp panel, right? The 200 yeah. panel has a higher value house, so that just naturally gets rolled in. You're only going to do that once. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well, I mean, really, for the, the whole a 400 pan amp panel thing, I would like just put in two 200 amp panels and then be done with it. Yeah, I wanted to do because I did not realize this. They don't like doing it, but you can. You can yep. go 50 percent over what you rated for and a house is rated at 400 so technically speaking you could go up to 600 not saying that you would use all 600 but you would put in your 400 amp in the in the house mm -hmm. and you put you know 200 amp in a shed or in your garage yeah um, but so I, i'll probably do that i'll probably put um you know a 200 amp in the garage or something like that yeah my uh my mother's house had a 60 amp fuse box. Yes, I say fuse. 
uh, when we redid that to uh, to breakers, I think we went with 100 amp service, just because if we went anything bigger, they would have had to pull uh, pull a new pigtail all the way from the the pole, the transformer to the house. So. Yeah, saves a saves a meter cost for you. That's very expensive. Mm -hmm. I found, found out that much. What is what is a resin use actually? Okay, because I was doing the numbers on this for myself. Oh, and, as, as far as how much power does it draw? Yeah, yeah. Like for a regular FDM, you know, you're pulling basically at its peak. Now, again, this is the thing when you're preheating mm -hmm. at your peak yeah. for 10 minutes, you're basically pulling 300 watts. 400 watts, whatever it's rated at. Okay. Mm -hmm. Operating temperature, I'm sorry, or operating consumption is only at mm -hmm. like half of that or a third of that. It's only at like 150 yeah. watts or so, maybe 100, mm -hmm. again, whatever it's rated at. So mm -hmm. it doesn't really pull that much. So yeah, I don't so... know what the difference between that and a resin is pulling so because the, it's powering a screen mm -hmm. rather than well, motors. Well, it it's really it's it's the ultraviolet light source is is the gigantic yes, energy yes. hog inside the thing. Um, the bigger thing with a resin printer is it is much more of a oscillating draw. Uh, be, because you're you're cycling that light source on and off, so it it let's say it's on for three seconds, it turns off, probably have about me somewhere around eight seconds worth of it moving the Z-axis up and down and setting it for the next layer before it turns back on for about three seconds again. Um, depending on your printer, uh, it's going to draw anywhere between, let's say, 130 watts up to the big boys, probably draw closer to 300 when the light is on and the light is off it's probably drawn about 40 watts so if you were to average that out you're looking at you know anywhere between a a 60 to 180 watt consistent load but it, it's much more it, it, it's a surge load kind of like a motor start Basically, every time that UV light kicks on, your your watt needs you know spike. Yeah. So I'm I'm reading it here. I'm listening to you. I'm looking at my own numbers, and I'm reading it here. Mm -hmm. Now again, this is a FDM. Mm -hmm. Fifty watts an hour seems a little bit low, whereas what you're saying. Again, that UV light. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Each UV light it's pulling. I think when I did when I was building mine, it was like twelve. It was like twelve watts of bulb, and I had I'm yeah, sorry, so five watts of bulb, and I had twelve or twenty five mm -hmm. bulbs or something like that. So it came out yeah to, the know, hundred fifty so watts. At, so at at max output, uh, the UV light source that is my Jupiter will draw three hundred watts. But again, it's not pulling that 300 watts consistently. That's only to do its Correct. first initial layers. Well, no, that, that, is, that is every time it cycles on to expose a layer. A layer. Now, again, it's, it's only on for about a third of your total cycle time per layer because mm -hmm. the rest of that is, is the Z-axis moving and resetting. Um, now, you, you can turn down the, the power output. Uh, the light sources support PWM. So I remember you saying that, yeah. Yeah, so un unfortunately, AnyCubic is the only brand that exposes, well, no, Epax does as well, that gives you a way to change that on the printer. But it's actually, those are parameters inside the, the sliced file. You just have to set that in your slicer. So most people would run, let's say, 80% power. So, you know, you're drawing 240 watts instead of 300. That's what I was kind of figuring, like, right there, if you're pulling, you know, 100 watts off of that, the motor's pulling 50, you give yourself another 10, 20 for whatever mm -hmm. else. Yeah, you're at one, 
Well, and I mean, 200. So, well, I mean, so the other, so remember, so the only thing that's running while that light is on is going to be the light, the screen, and the cooling fan. Light turns off, motor turns on. The motor and yeah. the light are never running at the same time. So you're, you're just, you're not adding those two loads together to figure out what your draw is going to be. That's just going to even out the curve of your highs to your lows for what that draw is going to be. And I know the power company charges based off of what your max draw is. So for example, if you're running a welder in your garage and you do a, a weld for five minutes, and it pulls it pulls three kilowatts. Um, you will get charged at the three kilowatt rate being used for the duration of all of your operation, it, regardless. It regardless, it if you have like your stuff running out in the house. So, it depends it, on the power company. Some do it that way. Some do not. And of course, commercial is way different than residential. What does Michigan have? I know Edison goes up a little bit. Uh, farther D Detroit, Michigan, Edison, but... and then Con okay, so it is DTE. So, then. so we have, uh, yep. So DTE, uh, Consumers Energy is another one, and then. Oh, fooey. I can't remember the third company that's in different areas. But to, to give you an idea, so, so the month of December um, of this past year, because I, I have my printer hooked up to a smart outlet, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I can turn it on ahead of me going out there so it can preheat, because when you yeah. first turn it on, the uh, thermostat that I went with for my VAT heater, it turned, it, it, it actually cycles on when, when you give it power initially. Uh, so handy feature. Yeah, does it work pretty instantly or is there a slight delay in the power? You know, meaning is it going through Wi-Fi or Bluetooth? Is there a certain range? What's the smart outlet running through? Four dollars and sixty-five cents worth of electricity, oh, and that you, is for. Oh, you really broke up there, Chris. Can you can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how am I now? So, um, yep. Repeat what you were saying. Okay, it, so month of December, I used just shy of twenty-six kilowatt hours worth of power. Okay, for a total of four dollars and sixty-five cents uh, worth of electricity. Okay, so yeah, so you're paying about 20 cents, 20 cents or so. So yeah, yeah, so that'd be about right then. You said $4? Yep. Out of 20 kilowatts? So yeah, 4, 20, 26 kilowatt hours as like $4.65. and cents. Yeah, yeah, you're paying 17, 18 cents per kilowatt hour. So that is yeah. slightly or on the high side um, but mm -hmm. dep again depending on your area company what you're yep. using so on and so forth but yeah yep. that's so that's so that's actually what i've been doing and right that number power box, usage so that's a good number okay okay and that power usage is for the printer as well as the curing station because they are both on that circuit i like how you bundled those together on that plug so you know the total consumption Per well, it, it's workflow. So Not that that is a handy byproduct. Um, the other nice thing is it's an outdoor timer smart outlet, so I can individually turn the outlet on or off with a timer. So my my big homegrown curing station, I put the stuff in, I turn it on, I open the app up on my phone, I set a timer. It's like okay, turn this off in twenty minutes. Go. And then yeah, 20 minutes helpful. later, it will magically turn off. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like this is so the the fact that it does the power monitoring is 
pure added convenience. It was not in the purchase decision at all. Yeah, but worthwhile though. Sure. Oh yeah, yeah. And it depends on your materials too. You know, what mm -hmm. you're using, that's obviously a higher wild, wild card, but Brian, mm -hmm. have you printed in pet G lately? In PETG at all, or no, for outdoor stuff, or do you I have, have anything? Uh, I'm looking for ideas. Um, no, I haven't. I haven't printed in that in quite a while. I've got. I didn't two know spools. if you had any. Yeah, I got. Big... I got two full spools in the garage because um, I bought one by mistake. Mm -hmm. But yeah, did, I, did you go ooh pretty color? And oh yeah, it no, I just I bought white. I <laughs> I needed white and I needed it quick, you know. And I clicked ooh. on it and it showed up the next day. And I'm like, boy, that feels kind of soft, you know. <laughs> and I looked at it and it said Pet G on it, and I'm like, oh man. Well, the nice thing is it prints identical to PLA, so yeah. you know, minus the temperature, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. just boost up the temperature a little bit. Um, something about the retraction too can help your um, the stringing this, but you know that's kind of a byproduct of it. Just it's a little stringy. But I didn't know if you did anything outside, you know, related to that or like what we talked before. Yeah. You did something for your Mustang, and you you know, yeah, you do your steering wheel, and then you go out and after work, and you grab the steering wheel, and it's a little soft, and you go, ooh, shouldn't have did that in PLA. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was like butter. Mm -hmm. So did you guys see the recent uh, press release from Prusa regarding the XL? I uh -huh. saw it was like maybe delayed or something. I didn't read the press release. Yeah, it, so it, it looks like they're, they're making some design changes compared to the, the original prototype unit they had showed off. Um, looks like they're still working through some engineering issues. Okay. Um, I, they may have mentioned how long of a delay they were expecting it to, to cause, but yeah, I don't remember what remember that. Um, I know some of the functionality, like it, some of its movement speeds, like as it's changing tools, things like that, um, they're moving way faster than the prototype was. Because uh, they showed off some new uh, new video footage of it. Yeah, that thing's it, it is a different beast when you have that automatic tool change with yep. such a dramatic different hot end. Yeah, you know it's not it's 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 not that you're changing from a three D printing head to a CNC head, right? Mm -hmm. You're actually changing, you know, the the tool that is being used. So it is almost instantaneous multi-color, multi-material 3D printing. Mm -hmm. And everything is very easily isolated. So there's yeah. less maintenance, which is less maintenance. And yeah. um, I want to say something with like collaboration, construction or something, but- um, you, you, Yeah, you, you can easier do multi-material prints. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing I did note is they now have a wiper in their uh, in their design, so okay. when it goes to do a tool change, it will extrude a little bit and then wipe clean, uh, just to make sure there's nothing you know oozing at the bottom of the nozzle that is going to shove into your print. Um, they do not have a a poop shoot like the bamboo carbon does. Uh, yep. There's just drops it like off to the the edge of the bed or something. I'm like, eh, okay, fine, whatever. I never like that because that eventually does build up, as we know. Uh, oh, 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 yes, so, yes. I it's, again, it's not a big deal, but it's just a slight hassle. Where mm -hmm. could you at least wipe it in a tray? Yeah, I'm sorry, in a, in, in the same section where it's tapered, so it goes into a tray, or it goes outside, yeah. or it goes into an inside yep. tray, and you can just simply well, so... remove that. Yeah, so so oddly enough, that's what the the X1 carbon has in it. Uh, what people weren't really noticing is 
if that starts to overfill, because let's say whatever you stuck behind the machine to catch the stuff fills up and it, it backs up, uh, your your print head will will whack it, uh, usually with enough force to dislodge the plastic casing off the front of it, which they held it on with magnets. So there's no damage to anything. It just is probably going to mess up your print. Um, yeah. They're now adjusting in their AI because they have the camera on board the X1 <clears throat> Carbon to basically do detection for is that over full? If so, pause the print. But that's something that uh, a bunch of the reviewers uh, ran into because, uh, well, apparently they, they missed this edge case. <laughs> No, luckily as, as it's an know, easy, e easy software fix. Yeah, it's one of those things of, well, the engineer never it thought someone would have this happen, so they didn't design around it. That's just the way that works. That that's. I don't know if you said it or Brian, you said that, but it, we all know that once you get it into the hands of users, they mm. will break it in a way that you never thought was possible. Oh yeah. Oh, 100%. You know, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's so, like so, uh, the, the old adage of no plan survives first contact with the enemy. I'm like that, that's, yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, you can only think of so many variables. And when you put it in the hands of someone, they're going to find new ones that you never thought of. <laughs> and that's why preparation, exactly to your point right there, you know, that's why preparation is so important, but, and I was just saying this to the uh, Bitcoin group last night. It's in the same sense, like right now it's a bear market. So everybody's crying in the corner, the Bitcoin's price is down, all that stuff. But mm -hmm. we, we know what's going to happen. It's going to go to the moon, you know, in the next cycle, in two or three years. And everybody's going to be crying that, you know, we're at $100,000, whatever number. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. You know, just as you did four years ago, because it was at 3000 and then four years prior, mm -hmm. it was at 500 you know, everybody, okay, fine, great. Mm -hmm. Well, now is the time where you build. And when you have these times to go and build, this is where you have the moments to go and actually provide the value. So mm -hmm. same thing in, you know, that first iteration, not only are you building, but more importantly for how fast, our, you know, our industry changes, how fast 3D printing changes, mm -hmm. you need to go and build and iterate just mm -hmm. as fast not so so not only do you have the time up front for yourself you know if you have a problem that you didn't see your users you know whatever you know break or do but you have the team that can turn around a patch in mm -hmm. less than 48 hours right yeah you know that's incredible and that's where software makes a ma uh, a major you know upgrade to to many things obviously 3D printing is just digital manufacturing, you know, which is awesome. So that's mm -hmm. on, the, on the fly change and stuff like that. So, um, you know, how do you actually get that rapid iterative change? Yep. Consistently. That's what's, that's what's super, super challenging. So yeah. I, so yeah, I'm, I, I'm going to be curious to see. So th this exact scenario. So as I was mentioning with the, the PWM and, not all of the printers, you know, expose it through the menu. Well, I'm going to be sending an email off to Elegoo saying, you know, hey, uh, my Jupiter is using the exact same Chi2 systems board that the EPAX E10 has. The EPAX allows me to change this through the UI. Chi2 says that the board that's in my Jupiter, that's the same board, also supports using these properties but it's not present in the UI. Hey, can we get a firmware update so we can change this in the UI and, and, and see how long it takes them? I guess, yeah, I guess. You, what do you have, a Mars or a-, a uh, Jupiter. No, you Jupiter. Jupiter. I, I have the big one. Yeah, this, this big old boy. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, that is yeah, that is cool. But I do like I do like the design and mm -hmm. the uh, size too, you know, you're printing a whole foot, right? You know, that's yeah. you know, yep. that's a big that's a big print area to go and utilize. Yep. 
now the one thing like there's been there's been several people that have come into some of the discords i'm on or will post on reddit hey i'm gonna buy a first printer this is the one i want to get it's like no do not buy a large format resin printer as your first resin printer please please don't buy a little one like a mars or a sonic mini and learn that because any variations any issues are only magnified by the bigger print volume like, oh, my bed's a little out of level. Well, your bed is four times as large now. So that little bit becomes a lot. You know, things like that. It's, there are other things that you have to account for when using a large volume printer that aren't as important with a smaller build volume printer. I can definitely say I, did not realize the complexity of a larger format resin so i should have played with like you said a four inch bed not a nine inch bed or a two inch i, bed I mean i mean you know like a bed. you know like a nine so that that's basically a saturn size um that that one that's still okay um anything bigger than like a 10 uh, uh, anything bigger than a nine inch is you've now stepped into large form factor and there are other considerations you have to have wh when you're setting up build plates for printing so on and so forth um saturn size eh, it, it, it has some caveats you have to think about but uh, again they're magnified further the bigger you go now yeah. Per personal experience, I started off with a 10 inch printer. So I had to learn all of these things myself. So this is experience talking. Yeah, that's the best teacher. So, so. yeah, but I, I know, you know, a lot of people see giant build plates go, oh, I can print all these big things. Like, well, you're going to need to learn how to support things. Um, if you're printing giant stuff, it's not going to be pre supported. So you need to learn how to support things. When you're printing a huge thing, you have to support it very differently than if you're printing a miniature. So you're going to have to learn all of this. You can't just hit auto supports and inspect it to magically print. That's not how this works on the resin side of things. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little different. I wish it did. Yeah. Wow, that's a big mask. I didn't realize how yep. tall that was. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, that's a single print. So that was probably printed at maybe like a, a 35 or 40 degree angle inside the, the build chamber. But yeah, wow. that, that's a that's single print. That's cool. And, and I understand why you do it on an angle, but I'm, I'm also curious. Well, it doesn't matter where the supports are at because you can always, especially for something like that, you have a tremendous amount of flat surface area where you can easily go and sand that down on the backside, right? Exactly. So you, yeah. So you you're one hundred percent. Your supports are going to be on the backside of that, and then yes, it's easily accessible to sand any bumps that you do have. Um, oh, so they yeah. have there. There's basically two different kinds of tips for resin support. One is like your traditional, like a like a cone shaped. Uh, the other one is actually a ball. So when you use the ball shaped ones, basically half of the sphere of the ball will be penetrating into the surface of the thing you're supporting. So it leaves a bump after you take your support off. Well, that also makes it really easy because now you're sanding down a bump to smooth versus filling in a divot. So when you're doing larger pieces like this, you're going to be doing some finished sand anyways, most likely. Um, so using a ball type, you're going to much easier be able to get down to that finish smooth than having to like fill in divots with Bondo, go back and smooth over that. You know, it's always easier to take away than to add when it comes of to, course. you know, sand, sanding and smoothing. Yeah, yeah. And especially if you're doing something where you have access to remove that. Yes. Some of those finer yes. details, if you're doing the miniatures, right, 
Mm -hmm. that's getting down to such a level that you, you can't sand 10 microns, right? Or a hundred microns. It's not as yep. easy as, a, yep. uh, you know, a half an inch, you know, you know, square surface area mm -hmm. inch of worth of, you know, you know, surface, um, yep. you know, bumps to hit. Those are a little bit, yeah, yeah, that's definitely different, but mm -hmm. yeah, the, re the, the resin stuff to sand is, is much easier. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make a mold, you know, you can go and do, you can go and do that and sand it, make it cleaner, you know, for casting and stuff. Yep. Uh, how do you, how do you make a, um, how do you make a metal cast? So, so if I want to pour, let's make an example. I, mm -hmm. I, I 3d print my hand, you know, let's, yep. let's say it's all perfect. I scan it. I 3d print it. You know, how do I yep. go from my 3d printed hand? to a metal cast where, where you just constantly okay. pour yep. them back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Yep. So, so the way that you're going to go from a, a resin print to a metal, um, so you are going to take that, that resin master that you have. And one of the things that you're going to have to accommodate with that is you have to have a entry point for the metal to flow in. Yeah. And the way that you design it, you have to be sure you're not going to have any air pockets. So usually you'll have to add additional material just to get that sort of a volumetric shape. So like, you know, let, let's say at the end of your wrist, you may have to add kind of like a conical shape to that. Correct. So there's no yep. flat space for, for air to trap because then you end up with a pocket and you have a failed cast. Yep. So once, once you have that done and you have that printed and you smooth it to however you want, you're going to actually do basically a plaster cast. So you are going to you know, cast around that in plaster and then you are going to burn out the resin. They do make resins that are designed for a burnout mold process that burn out more cleanly. They leave less ash or anything behind. So you, you burn that out, um, which the same process, you're, you're also baking the plaster. Once that burnout process is complete, you, you know, heat, heat your metal up to a liquid state. You pour it into your plaster mold. You then can take your plaster mold in that, you, you drop it in your, your water tank. The plaster is basically going to dissolve just about instantly at that point. Um, you, you have your rough cast, throw it in an ultrasonic cleaner to get all the, you know, any like scale that built up on it off. And then at that point, beyond that, you're, you're then into polishing. Um, but, that is, a, but that is still a one mm -hmm. print burns off into plaster which dissolves into the cast it's still Correct. one print. so if yeah well so once you have that first metal casting you could then use it as as a master and do a, a two-piece I, I plaster cast um but if, a lot of times when you're talking doing metal casting like that, you would rather have it be a one-time use cast because that way you don't have errors in the mold that appear. Yes. So it, 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 it depends, I guess, on how many of the thing you're trying to cast and what level of uh, degradation you are willing to accept in the cast. Because no matter what, that plaster is it, that's a one-time use mold. Um, the the question is, are you making them in a in two pieces off of a master that you're using more than once, or is this a single run, you know, one and done? Um, if you're doing something like, let's say, you're doing like a a, a decent sized signet ring, so still a, a relatively small part, but you know, that's easy enough to, you know, print a plate of a dozen copies of your resin master. And then I, I don't care that I'm only getting one use out of that before I do my burnout. Um, you know, if you're talking something a little bit larger, you know, let's say a, a bust or something like that. Okay, well, maybe 
maybe I've now crossed the threshold where I would rather have that master be reusable. There's different casting techniques that you can use. And it's, so, so that, yeah, so the, it just depends on your application. So that example, mm -hmm. I'll just say that would be if I want to, I, I 3D printed a new design for a uh, water spigot. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I want to pour it out of cast and I want it to be um, uh, poured out of cast and stainless steel. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so basically you would, you know, and, and I want, and I want to make a thousand of them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it would be. Your so if you're, if to... you're talking like that level of volume, you, your best bet would be to have a intermediary stage where you make a silicone mold of that master after cleaning you know after doing most of the cleanup work yeah um, the first cast yeah it, yes so then you, then you make your silicone mold of that resin master that you've cleaned and then you just you just do resin pours to to get a bunch of masters and then you can do your plaster lost cast because you can end up making a mold yes it takes a, a couple of generations to do it but you could then have a silicone mold where you can make 10 copies of that at a go. Exactly. Yeah. And then you're, you're working in, you know, batch of 10, yada, 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 that, that sort of a thing. So those, those are techniques that can be used to, you know, up the production volume without all your labor time as, you know, doing it a one-off. Yeah, because again, it, to me, it just seems like printing, everybody wants metal, obviously. That's what Dave came, you know, last time, um, you know, he comes, yeah. you know, on occasion, you know, as you guys know now, um, mm -hmm. other ones have come in and asked, you know, everybody wants to 3D print metal, you mm -hmm. know, but the problem there is you can't at the level that you want it to perform. So you need to yep. go to that casting or that forged process. But how mm -hmm. do you scale that at a, garage one-off you know hey i want to only do 10 runs of them mm -hmm. but that means instead of 3d printing it in a 30 hour time frame with mm -hmm. an 80 percent success rate i can you know and the cost is 50 dollars per unit i can yeah. make a master for 75 dollars but mm -hmm. every one after that i go and only pay five dollars per copy right instead of yeah. 50 you know that to well, me, the, that's the difference the you only know. constraint there with, with doing the, the the metal casting is going to be the size of your forge the size of your kiln basically correct and and nobody's gonna to me nobody's gonna have a kiln right brian it's like why yeah. people go to the mm -hmm. library and mm -hmm, obviously yeah. they don't uh, for three D printing, as we know, <laughs> but <laughs> right. it's it's a it's a valiant it's a valiant effort. Um, I'm trying to get my machines in there. I'm trying, like I told you guys before, I'm trying to. Brian, we tried this you know, last year, two years ago. You know, yeah. hey, you know, can you guys give us a call, and we will come in and you know help revitalize this program. Okay, so mm -hmm. um, you know, to me, you're not going to have a kiln. You know, yeah. at your house, you could. It would be ideal. That how awesome would that be if you could actually have a of quality metal filament that you were food grade, able mm -hmm. to bake in your home kitchen oven. You know mm -hmm. that would be ideal. We know how challenging that is, but mm -hmm. um, to me, you're going to go and print that. And you're going to take it somewhere, and they're they're going to bake it, and it's going to be done. Or you're mm -hmm. just going to have them do it and then you just go and pick it up, right? They print it and bake it all right there until you get it into the machine itself. And that's a different, mm -hmm. you know, conversation. You'll get SLS before then, I think. But um, yeah, it, it seems like that's just the way uh, to go because it's not worth it for somebody to have a $5,000 machine Mm -hmm. with a you know five thousand dollar kiln because they want a certain size yeah yep. mm -hmm. that's a big chunk for uh, most, yeah. most people yeah 
yeah even to do like a, a single like signet ring size i think you're looking at somewhere around fifteen hundred dollars in in the equipment to to be able to do that yeah exactly I think this is the website. You've seen this many times before, Brian. Um, Chris, I don't know if I showed you this before, but um, like you look at their filaments and products going through mm -hmm. the metal. They've added stuff. They've done their own kind of thing now. Um, but if you want, yeah, there you go. Go here. You know, if you want to go and buy, and I, and I bought filament from, from these guys, I've, I've tested out the 316s, stainless, wherever that's mm -hmm. at. Uh, this is, oh my gosh, they might not even have it. Oh, there it is, yeah. Yeah, now it's freaking almost $160. Um, you can go get your own kiln, your powders mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and there's a whole process on the backside. I would love to print this Pyrex stuff mm -hmm. so I can actually have like an official Pyrex bowl I think yeah. that'd be really cool. Um, you know, okay, you I didn't zinc. realize they had the Pyrex filament. That's actually pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I've said before, and it's not that expensive. You know, for a half a kilogram. And the other thing too. Well, I mean, I I would hope it wouldn't be because it's basically silica. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, it is. Yeah, right there. It's basically a uh, hundred and forty dollars per kilogram. Kilogram. Yeah. Yeah, but again, you got the Pyrex official, you know, copyright. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I don't know how it bakes. I'm not sure how, you know, that would work. So on and so forth. But it's mm -hmm. it's cool to see. But who's going to actually print this? Get the kiln. They have kilns on here as well. I've never bought one, but and then they they finally doing this. Like right there. Mm -hmm. Are you going to go and spend eight thousand dollars on a kiln? And get it in two months? No, of course not. You know, so you know, it's somebody else has to go and do do that post processing part. Let alone means, that kiln draws ten thousand watts. Yeah, ten thousand eight hundred watts. It is a forty five amp draw. Yeah, exactly. So I guarantee you. You know, that is not something that somebody is going to be able to run at their home yep. easily, right? I can mm -hmm. go and do it, no problem. Um, the, the body shop can, you know, all, those types of places. A small, like your mother's, you know, small little home or something like that, or mm -hmm. you know, what my panel was here before, there's no way I could go and run that off. Yep. Um, a hundred amp panel yep. with everything else going on there. Mm hmm yeah, so that's that's totally totally different, and I don't know any other way to go and yeah, I don't know any other way to get a metal product in your hand any quicker than how that yeah, is no. there. To to me, yeah. the only other way is, and again, I'm blown away that we don't have this yet to that level. There's no DIY or under ten thousand dollar all metal powder SLS, you know, desktop three D printer. There's you know, nothing. I I I think a big reason for that is really more around the safety concerns dealing with powder. So what specific? Um, you you are, have are you to wear just the air. You, you yeah, need just the... yes. You need proper respiration okay. and proper handling of that because if you breathe that shit in, it's gonna screw you up. I I actually I think you're right there because it's in the same reason. Again, I have I have one of these. Brian, you you've seen it. No, I have mm -hmm. not done anything with it, which is embarrassing. <laughs> but that um, it's not an object. Uh, it's a Z corp. A Z Corp um, SLS nylon powder based thing. Uh, it uses gypsum mm -hmm. powder for its medium. Okay. So I can go and actually make my own. It's a recipe, whatever else. Okay, great. And then it has a dye in there so you can do up to 
256 color, right? You know, you know magenta, cyan, yellow, whatever else. Mm-hmm. Um, so really cool. Basically, you can get multicolor powder prints, which is amazing. Um, the problem exactly was what you just said. It's very itchy, like insulation, if it stays on your hands, right? So the moment mm-hmm. that I lift that up and I sort it out, I need special gloves. Now we're getting into the same conversation as handling resin, right? You don't yeah. just grab resin with your hands and then wipe it off on a paper towel and go and eat your bag of chips, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you just don't do that. <laughs> Please don't do yep. that. Um, yep. I think it's in the same sense. What happens if somebody dumps four, and I, I've had this issue before, as you know, Brian, how much powder is needed in the yeah. vat, right? Versus how much somebody is willing to potentially use and lose so yeah. when my very large scale 24 inch you know print bed for, for the resin that vat required you know to pull up to cover the whole bed and to pull off with the surface tension that was required there i needed like 400 dollars worth of resin in that glass bed that's not something that you could just you know, dump yeah. all that resin into there. It's just not worthwhile. Yeah. So same thing. What's the pr- what's the aluminum powder or the stainless steel powder plus that cost, right? That's yeah. probably very very expensive if you want stainless steel, and it's a two two pounds. Worth and of on powder, top of right? that, with most of those powder bed fusion printers, that that powder is basically one time use. Um, you, you can mix in a percentage of old powder, um, but you, you have to keep it mostly virgin powder. And the reason why is the powder that is near where the, the laser is centering is still being heated a bit. So for consistency in the material properties, they're only going to rate that, you know, like, oh, no, you can re- have 20% reuse, but the rest has to be, you know, virgin or 50-50 or whatever that mix is. But so oh, now wow. you're going to have, yeah, so now you're going to have tailings that you basically can't use. Now, I did just hear on a podcast in the last week or so, uh, there is a company that has powder bed fusion. I can't remember which one it is. Um but they're now saying that you can, yeah, you can basically reuse the powder near infinite number of times. So you gotta, you gotta strain it somehow. Y- yeah, it. yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You you have to you have to filter it to make sure there's no you know chunks that sort of thing. That be good. That still is just a, mm-hmm. a cost, you know, a cost for the home yep. hobbyist. Y- yes, that is. You think resin's messy? That powder? Oh my gosh! Yeah, don't sneeze. <laughs> well, yeah, that's yeah, and and that's that's right. To me, that's the main the main kicker there. I don't know if you can go and recycle that. Mm. Yeah. The meaning oh. being you used in the regular recycling process. I think you can. I mean, the stuff is, it is for the most part metal with a bit of a carrier. I mean, I, I wouldn't see why that wouldn't be recyclable at, at any normal recycling center. Okay, that's nice then. But the powder itself is not recyclable, meaning for plastic filament, again, you can't do it with resin um, mm-hmm. either. Uh, you know, at the very least, if you did your own recyclable filament grinder and maker at home, you know, you can at least get one more run you know, out of the um, recyclable mm-hmm. filaments. You know. Well, and I mean, you know, so, so again, if you're like, if you're taking those tailings and you're mixing that in with new material, you know, you, you're at least cutting down on the amount of new material that you need while not just throwing the scrap away. But there's, there's no way you're going to get a hundred percent, you know, use out of it. You're, you're going to have waste at some point down the line, no matter what. It's just, what can you do with said waste? Yeah. Yeah, that was the secret sauce to gasoline. 
for automobiles, mm-hmm. you were they were dumping the waste product from kerosene into the river mm-hmm. with gasoline and then lo and behold they found out how volatile it was and mm-hmm. you know look how uh look at what that waste product has turned into right nobody uses kerosene anymore you know mm-hmm. i wonder if you could actually use old resin as as like a recyclable in a sense, so, maybe maybe as a fuel, maybe as like a oil based burning mm, fuel, but I don't know. Well, I mean, so so o- over time, some of the the chemicals inside the resin break down. Um, the the one that is most sensitive to that is oddly enough the photosensitizer. Um, that is what is the the kickoff for the the chemical reaction. It's the catalyst. You can buy just, you know, straight photosensitizer. Um, so you could theoretically, if you wanted to, basically re-dope old resin. So, you know, because resin has a shelf life and after that it, yep. it can be kind of spotty. I mean, you could re-dope it with photosensitizer and odds are you'd be able to print fine. Now, the caveat is you better do that in a big enough batch because you're going to have to recalibrate recalibrate for that doped resin because you're never going to get it back to the same exposure needs as what it was originally. You're, you're just never going to get that lucky because you don't know which exact photosensitizer was originally used and how much of that is still left in, that's still active inside the old resin. Um, so it's, you're basically reformulating at that point. And I'm like, yeah, you, you can do that. Just do it in a large enough batch that you don't go nuts having to calibrate for each batch. So me personally, good. me personally, I would say I would want to do a batch of like three liters and no less just to make it worth the while. That way you can calibrate it once and you got a couple of liters worth of resin for printing. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, so you still have, you still have more to, to, to print with. Yeah, well, I mean, so the, the calibration print that I, I use typically, it only uses like 17 milliliters per print. Oh, that's nothing. Y- yeah, exactly. It, it's not much. So with the, you know, the liquid resin that's going to come off that's stuck to that part, you know, let's say maybe we'll, we'll go 25 milliliters on the high end. So I can print a whole lot of those out of a liter I mean, odds are I'll probably end up having to print somewhere between maybe two to five to, to dial the, the exposures in. Yeah. And then, then you're off to the races. So it's, it's a little bit of that time investment to do it. But once you're dialed in, as long as you got a couple of liters worth that's going to behave similarly, okay, I'm fine spending that little bit of time. I'm not fine doing that for 500 milliliters worth of, of tailing resin. I would wait longer. Yeah, I'm going to have to try it. So there's actually some folks like, oh, yeah, you know, why don't we just get add more sensitizer to it so we can reduce our exposure times? Like, well, the more rapidly that reaction kicks off, you are going to change the length of the polymer chains that form you're not going to have the material properties that were originally intended. Um, so for instance, it might be very, very rigidly strong, but brittle as glass. You, know, you, you don't want it to cook off too fast. So the, you have to kind of ride a line, I guess would be the way to describe it. And, yeah, and really one... Once you do that a couple of times, you'll you'll get a good feel of okay, how much do I need to add to get me in the ballpark? But there definitely is going to be some trial and error there the first couple of times you do it. 
but I have yet, I haven't, well, okay, I might have gotten one bottle of resin that was kind of iffy, but out of the, at this point, you know, 10 to 20 liters of resin I've used, I've had one bad bottle, and it printed mostly, uh, I just, it, there were some very funky outcomes with some of the prints that I'm pretty sure I narrowed down to the resin. Well, that's not bad then for, you know, for what you, what you had. Yeah. Cause I mean the, the, the shelf life of, of resin is anywhere between 12 to 18 months. So ideally you're not buying resin that far out from using it anyways. Yeah. So, or at least buying it in any great quantity that far out. You know, if you have a bottle sitting on the shelf and it's getting near that one year mark, well, is if you have other bottles of resin, this is the time to, to go ahead and, you know, mix that into a, you know, what I'll call a slurry. Do your exposure test on the slurry and then just run through that as, as you're up a mix and and be done with it yeah brian how long have you had mm -hmm. some of that just regular Boy. filament sitting in the garage like that's oh, been over impressive. a year yeah i've i've had stuff like a year and a half you know opened sitting in well, the garage I mean, so like, then, then i've used it i mean like pla you you wouldn't have an issue with PTG, yeah, okay, you might have a little bit of a moisture issue. Depends. Um, nylon would be where you'd have to go, oh, God, it's gotten wet. Um. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been lucky. I really have only thrown away maybe two spools. Mm. That's not bad at all. No. Uh -uh. Yeah, I mean, I, I so... From, from what I've heard from a couple of folk, nylon is really where it matters. And at that point, you really want an active drying unit for nylon. And you once you get the nylon, you want to print the things you need out of the nylon. Yes, immediately, not yeah, not. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> so that, that's something where if, if I ever go down that road, uh, I get to reap the benefits of my brother doing a lot of uh, meat processing um, during hunting season. So he's got a pretty good size vacuum packer. Nice. Uh, so I would, you know, chuck that sucker in the dryer, you know, get it as dry as it's going to go, chuck it in a bag with a big thing of desiccate and vacuum seal that sucker. And it. then it can sit like that and be okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the, yeah, that's definitely the way to do it. Yeah. There we go. All right, guys, I finally it finally came up there. I was impatient, <laughs> but I finally threw it up on the um, YouTube page. So mm -hmm. we'll see. We'll see what that does. I don't know what that. I don't know what it'll do, but hopefully, it gets more people to look at us and actually join. Join the group I, I was going to say, do you have the, do you have a link in the description to the meetup group? Yes. And I have, okay, it. Good. I just, yep. I just edited, I just edited, I just edited the Facebook page in there as well. Okay. So, okay. And then it's, um, yeah, it's, so it's a, it's a good connect over. I'll do the mm -hmm. meetup. I got to figure out how I just did that, but yeah, that's a good point. So you can, you see it. You look at it. It, it. Yes, that way you don't have to go look for it. You can just click link and it takes you right there. Yeah, exactly. It just pops it, pops it right up, and you're you're done. I'm trying yep. to. I I hate I hate being this person. I really do, but I'm learning how important it is, and that is, it. You got to have some clickbait. You need something. Mm -hmm. you yeah, need something you need something there to grab to, someone's yeah. attention. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, and that's just so, marketing. That, that's just how that works. Yeah, it's frustrating, but it, it definitely is uh, needed and utilized. So yeah, we're we're gonna try to get these so just as many as many young people 
that you would not even expect. <laughs> whatever, whatever that means. If you can get a, if you can get that twenty-year-old hot chick and she's a sophomore or junior in college, man, God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I really need to to send this uh, the, the group's info over to my cousin. Have it give give it to, to her two kids because they're both in uh in college for engineering degrees currently nice oh nice nice yeah the the one of them is he, he's going for I, I believe it's mechanical engineering um i i don't know if he has any further specializations in mind um her daughter actually wants to go for more of like patent law patent attorney um, but she started off on the engineering side, so that way she has the the design background. Uh, that yeah, that's a deadly uh, one two punch there for sure. Yeah, yeah well, exactly. Um, yeah, she takes her her LSAT. I think tomorrow, actually, now that I think about it, for the oh, wow. you know entr entrance into to law school. Yeah, that's not something to easily. No. <laughs> easily do. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard people having nightmare stories of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, basically, like she did a, she did a like a a course where you take a a practice LSAT, and then they basically guarantee you a increase of you know let's say forty points or whatever it is when you go to take the real one. Oh, so they already adjust based on what other people, you know, have taken that test at. So they already adjust. The well, it, it, and it's also, it's, you know, it, it's 100%, you know, teaching to the test um, per se. Um, but, but really more on top of that, it is teaching you how they're going to ask the questions in the test. You know, so, so you understand okay, if this is what you're seeing in the question, this, this is what they're looking for. You know, how to interpret what you're being asked, I guess is the, the best way to think about it. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting way to, interesting way to look at it. Yeah. So what do you got on the docket this weekend? Guys, what do you got on the docket for this weekend, Brian? What do you... <sighs> What do you got to uh, put together on the Mustang or, well, did you did, wait, did you already yeah. deliver the motorcycle or no? Yeah. Yeah. It's gone. So I got awesome. a little extra room in the garage. No, Good. I you got, got another three printers to go, right? That's right. <laughs> no. yeah. I, well, yeah, I definitely got to print something this week. I just don't know what yet, but um, I, I still don't have a car, you know, so I got to start believe really, that. yeah, I'm just getting to run around by the dealership. So I, I think I'm going to start looking for a new car this, this weekend. And what's the holdup on yours? Is it just uh, well, I, on parts? The war, the, I need a new engine. I need an engine rebuild. Oh, okay. um, they already did one under warranty. And then I, another 20,000 miles later, it broke down again. What? And, yeah. Oh, something's wrong with that. That means yeah. that, that's that they didn't they didn't rebuild it right if it lasted twenty k. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a known issue with with my vehicle, and um, there's been so many lawsuits that uh, mm. it's it's a lifetime warranty. Oh, okay. You know, um, so they need to foot the cost, but you know, I'm just getting the they they are just, just do gonna. It. Yeah, exactly. They're just going to yeah. drag their feet until you can't deal with it anymore. Yeah. So yeah, tomorrow will be nine weeks. I've been out of a car. Jeez. Yeah, I. Mm. So I, I think I think Saturday, my wife and I are just going to drive around, start looking at some stuff, and start planning ahead. You know. Yeah, that's so, unacceptable for that long. Yeah, yeah, it really is, and and to not have a, a rental car, and then you know to to have have to pay big money just to tow it back to the dealership and all that stuff, mm. it's, just, it's just not worth it. 
Yeah. Yeah, you're not so that, the first that's, person. That's probably my my biggest plan this weekend. I really don't have anything going on, you know. But yeah, I'll I'll, I'll print something. I'll tell you, I don't know if it was, I don't think it was my uncle's, uh, but it was somebody else's. They had a BMW come into the shop, and it was a newer newer one. It was a 21 or a 22. They got in a wreck. We've had this issue before, but it's just only been exacerbated the past two or three years. The part to order is not assembled in the factory for used vehicles. You know, so that mold that they make is only for, you know, mm-hmm. brand new vehicles that are going out. They're not making it yeah. for replacements. And it, it's like, it's usually like a six month trail. So anytime you get in an accident and the vehicle is less than six months old, you're probably going to wait for parts because just, yep. you just got to get out allocated. But yeah. even more so, yep. the parts were not even available for the new vehicles this time around. So <laughs> and this is a, this is, is this is not exact, but you get the point. Uh, it needed a front bumper, a hood, and a, a fender, a grill, and all that stuff. It was eighteen to thirty weeks out. <laughs> yeah, for this that's just insane. So you think about, it, and this is exactly what the guy did. My dad told him, and I think it was a doctor, and um, we're a doctor in the area driving a Beamer because my uncle has one and he had the same problem and we just told him to go do do that and this is what he did same thing for the doctor first and foremost you know you guys aren't hurting for money okay you're driving a beamer right it's not like you're you know you're you're uh, uh flashing your wealth tried trying to um you know get everybody to look at you you know you can afford it you can you know all that stuff okay great it's 30 weeks out you just got this two years ago Right, 30 weeks is basically over half a year. Yeah. You're going to be going to get a brand new vehicle six months after you get this one repaired. That's just when I can get the parts. I don't know when I'm going to get it into the shop, right? Yeah. So, you know, add two to three weeks on to that for repair time. So you are literally, oh, and by the way, you know, the prices are astronomical as, as we you don't know. So you're better off. And this is what they did. You're better off to turn in that vehicle, sell it to the insurance company and have them give you a check in return so you can go and buy a new vehicle. And that's yeah. exactly what they yeah. did. So they're now in a new vehicle and it took three weeks or it took six weeks instead of mm-hmm. 37, right? For yeah. an older vehicle. You're, you're just wait. You're wasting your time. I, and it's so sad that you, we, are, we are living in a world where you are disincentivized to repair. You're, you're incentivized to consume, throw away, buy yeah. new, right? And it's getting into the vehicles now too, which is just very, very frustrating. But how, how crazy is that? You know, yeah. it's $30,000 to repair the vehicle and it's a, a half a year out. Or wow. for an extra 50000 you can have a brand new vehicle. You can get it basically tomorrow or, um, you know, within three weeks or however long the you know, lead time is for what's in inventory. Of course, that's, that's thin. And you don't have to worry about anything for a year or two years. Yeah. What is the doctor yeah. going to choose? Right. It's, a, it's an uh, obvious choice. I tell you, I had, I had a weird thing just, you know, last week with the Mustang and I bought this, this $30 bar, you know, for the engine compartment. Mm-hmm. And it says, oh, yeah, it'll fit your year. Well, it'll fit my year if you have the V8. It won't mm-hmm. fit my year if you have a straight six. Uh, so, so I called them up and I said, hey, you know, I want to return this. And they're like, oh, yeah, no problem. What's the part number? And she's like, oh, yeah, don't bother. Just just throw it away. Mm-hmm. She, they don't want to handle, you know, the the a refund on a $30 part, you know, when you have shipping involved and yep. return to stock, you yep. know, so they're just like, now just destroy it, send us a pick and we'll, and we'll refund your money. Mm-hmm. You know? Which I, I think is just kind of crazy, but yeah, they just, they just don't want to deal with it. 
Yeah, that's that's insane. I I said this at dinner tonight, and right there you just you just alluded to basically what that number is. My dad said the same thing for insurance stuff. Um, yep. They're getting monies ahead of time before the job even comes in, so it's not a big deal if you're disciplined. But he's very disciplined, but it is a problem on your accounting, right? Why should I spend the money that I got paid for a job in sixty days today? Yeah. Where when I deliver that job, now I don't have any money, right? You know, that's not how mm -hmm. business normally works. But he, he was in a similar similar stance where he's chasing down an insurance bill or insurance check because they need to pay the processing fee. And it's like $12 or something. So then yeah. the people on the other end are like, you're telling me that I need to do all my processing work for twelve dollars and mail you a check. And you're, he's like, absolutely, yes, you owe that money, and that's the point. They know that it's not worth their time to go and process a thirty dollar payment, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's going to take them a half an hour worth of work to do so. They're already getting paid. You just make it up. They're getting paid twenty five dollars an hour. You know, they're getting paid a thousand bucks a week. We'll just throw yeah. an easy number. Okay, that's twelve dollars for thirty minutes, right? So anything less than twenty dollars an hour, it is not worth any company or any person to do anything in that you know. realm. It's and 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 that's what's crazy about it. What is your time? It's nice to know what the number is, but it is nerve wracking to see how high that number is getting to relative to the value that is that it is yeah. delivering. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm sure if it was, you know, a hundred dollar or more, you know, a more expensive part, they would have said, yeah, ship it back, you know, but yeah, I, it, at 30 bucks, you know, you got, you got the girl on the phone, you know, you got a guy on, on the receiving dock who's got to check it in. You know, he's got to throw it on a shelf. Another guy's going to pick it up and put it back into inventory. Exactly. You, know, you got five people that are going to touch that thing, you know, and uh, it's just not worth it to them. But, you know, it wasn't really their mistake. You know, I, I'm the one that ordered it. You know, I was more than willing to ship it back. You know, I just hate, I just hate to, you know, have a nice brand new part like that and, you know, have to throw it in the garbage. So I called a couple so, of buddies and asked them if they wanted to put it on their car, you know? So, so what you really should do here is, oh, Bonnie's coming in. Oh, that's nice. Um, what you really should do is 3d print one that looks like it. Yeah. Destroy that one. Destroy that one. Send them a pic yeah. of that. Exactly. Send them a picture of the one yeah. that you just destroyed. And then you just keep the one that you have, you know, yeah. that's, that's the way to do it. That's a good idea. It, hey Bonnie, how are you? Good to see you. Hey, all right. Thanks. Hey. Finally getting here. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, the the joke was, I saw this a couple weeks ago. I don't know if I told you guys. Um, uh, they were turning in the three D printed, uh, or well, no, they were turning in the uh, like guns, like guns that that weren't used, and they were like the state was buying them back or something. I don't know where it was at. And somebody brought in um, a bunch of 3D printed lowers of like pistols and stuff like that. And they got paid 50 or $65 or $100 per, wow. you know, per wow. lower like that. So that was the joke. They go, oh my gosh, if our state comes to that, I'm doing these all in shells, you know, just doing mm. one layer out. And, you know, yeah, I got $30,000 worth of, you know, guns to claim here that are all broken right and they're all just pieces of plastic right um <laughs> but but the funny thing the funny thing about that uh was you know why didn't it you know actually work for him i i have no i, I yeah I, I i have no idea uh but the fact that it Strength, actually did work yeah. yeah i yeah i i, I don't know but um, they they paid it. They processed. It. Wow. Um, you know the you know like it was it was, it was just the fine print that they forgot to you know yeah. add there. I guess, but it it worked. It was two, was two dollars in plastic. You know, 
eight yeah, hours exactly. on the machine and you get 50 bucks. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. exactly. Man. Yeah. Yeah. It, Why didn't exactly. I think of that? Yeah. So that's, so go and print your <laughs> little block and break it. And be like, yeah, don't worry about it. We broke it. Uh, because, because that's the thing. You're, you're the honest one. This is the hard part. I have a very difficult time doing this. I've talked about it before. If the game is perverted in such a way that it is robbing or it is disincentivizing somebody to use it or stealing in, in a sense or taking time away, whatever it is, but most of the people are using that, you're better off to join in on that game than to try and fight that wave because you're not going to go against the current there. So if everybody is you know basically throwing away things that are less than an hour's worth of human labor we'll just make it up twenty dollars or cheaper right thirty dollars or less you're better off to figure out your way to get the value for those sub thirty dollar things that you have when you don't have to return those back because they don't want them and to yeah. me that that's just so screwed up that, you, that you're figuring out a way to do that, but it does, it does work. Um, you know, you find, it, find a little hack around there, then go and use that for something else. Maybe you incorporate it into a piece and you, know, you, you, you buy that and, uh, instead or you use it for a vacuum seal uh, bracket yeah. or something like that. You know, there's all, there's all sorts of things that you can use that for. So, Bonnie, I finally uploaded a YouTube video. So, I didn't see if you had it in the – well, I don't know if you can view the old chat, but I'll throw it in the link um, again here. So, I'll put I'll start putting more stuff up here as time goes on. We copy-paste. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'll start putting more stuff up there and as time goes on. But Oh, yeah, it is up there. Yeah, there you go. We got the Facebook group. You got the Brian. Did, have you seen any good pictures on the Facebook group as of late? Has anybody put stuff up there? <laughs> you know, I'm I'm I probably post ninety percent of the stuff that's out there. Um, yeah. But the last thing I posted was the uh, the the hand mechanical hand thing. Oh yeah. A couple of weeks ago that we talked about. So I I've been slacking myself. I'll tell you, this stuff is very difficult. It's still processing to upload the HD, and that's been doing that since like seven o'clock. I know the other one I did before um, on the other channel that was that was like an additional two hours or so. So I know that's going to take take time. But this, all this stuff, you know, let alone building takes time, but actually oh, yeah. publicizing it and um, sharing. You know, so on and so forth. Making the edits, edits take the longest. I mm -hmm. I can't even tell you how long it makes. Go ahead and laugh at me for the girl and the pink and whatever else. But that that um, thumbnail took like a half an hour to make. <laughs> it's like this is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> this this stuff this stuff is too. This stuff takes way too long. I understand why people tape editors and you know social media managers and stuff like that one that's where the eyeballs are at and two oh my god does this stuff take time so thank you brian again for running the facebook page whether oh. people use it or not that's, a, that's yeah a it'll grow I, I mean you know there's a few people that post stuff but they never they never join in on the zooms you know so i have a plan for for this i have to pick my exact route that i, I want to take for that mm -hmm. i don't use facebook but i'll go and make another account or something like that for for this i want to eventually like what we said before i want to eventually have like this link be like a paid link or something for people mm -hmm. obviously not not you guys of course uh, but for people that wanted to join and everything is just live streamed to YouTube and Facebook and Twitch and all this other stuff. So I think that will help bring in 
some more attention if you see that hey the 3d printing club is live right you know click right now on the on the link even if they only watch for 30 seconds or something you know they still had exposure and interacted at that minimum level so sure i want to give that a shot uh, but i don't want to i don't want to try and do all of them at at one time i i would love to but um so i'll we'll try youtube first and then i'll get your get the credentials whatever is needed for the facebook page or maybe i can give you like api keys or something or however that works Mm -hmm. um and then that can just automatically stream when it goes and i don't know how long the limit is and so on and so forth but like there's pro again as you guys all know there's programs out there where you know for like 100 hours a month or 200 hours a month you can stream everything to every social media platform and aggregate all the chats and into one message and blah 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 and it's super seamless but it's pretty pricey so there's you know mm-hmm. other ways to do it in a more open source and budgeted manner so yeah. That might that might be a strategy, so it'll be be, be a little challenging. But um, Chris, I might need some resin content, so <laughs> <laughs> I can probably free, help with that. Free, yeah, feel free yeah. to make a, a quick quick how to to how to to clean your vat. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Brian, a little do a little head uh, scan, right for yeah. your. Uh, uh, helmets and stuff. How to get a, how to get a, a accurate dimension on on your um, helmets. I need to learn that myself. <laughs> <laughs> and that's perfect. There you go. Um, while I'm thinking of it, what was the scanner that you mentioned, Chris, before that was a high quality scanner? Uh, okay. So the the super high end ones are Artec, A R T E C. Uh, the more consumer price point available, uh, it's called the Revo Mini, R-E-V-O Mini. Uh, I can't remember the brand that makes that one. Yeah, five eighteen thousand dollars. That's way out of budget. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There Darren, we go. Re- Revo more. Point. Scroll, scroll up, 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 up. Yeah, there, there you go. Re, Re, Revo, yeah, Re, Revo Point Mini. It's about five hundred bucks, I think. Yeah, that sounds about okay. right. Okay. Little... Yeah, that's a little bit more in the budget. I don't mind a couple thousand dollar one, but I want to make sure mm-hmm. I can work with it first. And if it's a little bit yeah. less quality, yeah, mm-hmm. if it's down to point zero two, you know, twenty microns is good enough. Hmm. 3D camera too. Is that for the? Uh, so it, it is. It, so it is a blue light device. So it's not using true lidar. Um. So it's basically okay. bouncing blue light off of the surface, and then the camera is recording that bounce. That's how it works. Got it. Okay. Got it. Oh, there's the shop. I was looking toward the word. This is on the camhole, right? Yeah, 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 yeah it, it looks it, like it sits there. Yeah, it comes with a little itty bitty tripod. Yeah, right, but a, a gimbal so that it will stay level when you're moving around or whatnot. E- yes, they do have a gimbal as a option for an attachment. Okay. Yeah, right there. Although you usually what you're wanting to do is you want to make it stationary and then put whatever you're scanning on like a big lazy Susan. Right. Because it's easier for the scanning software to, to figure out where the, the reference points are if it is stationary and the thing is moving versus right. you moving around the thing. All right. 
Yeah, seven hundred dollars is not terrible for a price. I mean, it's very expensive. Mm-hmm. It definitely is expensive, but it's not out of. Yeah, I don't know what the premium package would be. Yeah, but if you're getting down to you know fifty microns, I thought I guess the mini is even higher quality. Zero zero five zero. Wait. Yeah, oh five, oh two. Yeah, I guess the mini is even higher quality. Yeah, dual access turntable. There you go, Chris. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is another brand, uh, E I N Scan. That's all one word. And they're they're definitely like a, a true lidar. They're they're on the Oh yeah, look they're at definitely that. above the Revo point. Yeah, they're like in the middle between Revo point and Artec. Oh yeah, you got the full scanners and stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's way out of my budget. I'm looking for. Y- yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but, now, so, I but, will but say... even stuff like that, though. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So so. The the 3D printing guy that I know down in Florida, he runs the 3D Musketeers channel on YouTube. Uh, he was able to pick up one of these of the the Pro 2X off of eBay for like two grand, I think it was. Um, you know, way way below what the the normal going rate for them is. Now, there is an issue with it. Uh, it's got a problem with this power supply, but the, the manufacturer is honoring the warranty and it's actually off for repair right now. So, but he, he's the guy who has like the $60,000 Artec Evo scanner. Like that's one of the things he does. Um, recently, one of the, the local big sports colleges paid him to come in and scan the legs of all of the football players for custom fit padding Mm. like well that's that's interesting (laughs) yeah that's the that's the really cool business propositions that you get with that you know Yeah, I don't know how much uh, how much I would like to do that, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, the the yeah. scanning itself that is yeah that's worth it. Where you go in, they're gonna buy you know the custom pads. Again, at that point, much, that's what I love about those types of people. And it has nothing about being rich or anything in that nature. It has mm-hmm. everything to do with that pure abundance and like opulence um, um, lifestyle. Where it has nothing to do with money. It's that the, the players need the absolute best and therefore mm-hmm. money is no object. So if you have something that can get the best, just get it done. And, it, mm-hmm. and it's a $60,000 scanner, right? <laughs> yep. Probably, well, I mean, your, your other option would be, yep. yeah, because I mean, the other option is, well, here, we're going to take casts of all of their legs oh, yeah, and no, send no. those off. And the company that's making the pattern is going to scan them in or you can just shortcut the whole cast piece, scan it yeah. in, send them the scans. Yeah, keep your life easy and just own that, own that yep. digital file, right? Instead of the shipping, that's the magic. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. I wanted to add it to my budget, so I'm gonna mm. have to try that. I don't know if I'll splurge for one of those, but you know, maybe six hundred. Yeah, I, I would say that the Revo point, so the only thing with a blue light scanner um, that, that I've learned is, so if it is a extremely highly reflective surface, or if it is a pure matte black, you could have some issues with, with accuracy with it being able to do the surface detection. Uh, in both cases, there are easy ways around that. Um, the, the ghetto solution is baby powder. Um, yep. if, if it's something you can't easily wash after the fact, 
they do actually have like an aerosol spray that you can spray on, and after about 10 minutes, it will fully evaporate, leaving no residue behind. Hmm. But the, the, the cheap solution is baby powder. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely done that before. I've yeah, I mean, that. that's... Well, I'm going to have to try this, but see, see how it goes. Yeah, I know... Uh... I think their Kickstarter for their Revo Mini 2 like e either just finished or is just finishing. I think it just finished. Um, Grant, the, the guy from 3D Musketeers, did back one. Um, of course, he hasn't received the unit yet, but I know as soon as he gets it, he is going to be doing a review. I'll be sure to, to throw a link in, in here once he does. Yeah, definitely. Please do. Mm -hmm. Hey, Max, take take your time with us. But before we go, can I ask you a couple things, or ask? Yeah, shoot you it. A couple things. Yeah, please. Okay, now good time. Yeah, mm -hmm. shoot yeah. it. Yeah. So, um, we have a my daughter and I have a Prusa printer. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> yeah it's a colorful tale about that thing um she got it going again because she was having problems with it right and yep. you mm -hmm. guys gave me a lot of really good suggestions for it uh working on it, fixing it so she had it going and then she was um she printed the flowers that she likes mm -hmm. and the regular Matt, I guess, and went through all the colors that she wanted on that, and then she wanted to do the same with uh, silk, and mm -hmm. it's just bound up, and it's the same brand, same diameter, the same everything, except one is matte and one is silk, and <laughs> so, yeah, it gets better. Um, so in trying to do the troubleshooting and such and cleaning things and whatnot she um was able to elicit a spark is that a way of saying it oh boy <laughs> yeah um it sparked out and it's black around the area and yeah she's pretty upset so what area did the spark is this like near on the print head near the hot end or is this I, by the circuit board i think it's by the hot the hot oh, end okay that would make that that would kind of make sense um so if it is the the small basically temperature probe it's called the thermistor okay. um if that's what arced those are cheap just yeah. replace it don't even ask just replace it. <laughs> okay. um, if it was the heating elements that arced, there is a small chance that it may have done some damage to the controller board with the amount of current that would pass through. Yeah. However, that's not a always, it's a, it might have. Um, if there is any any of that like carbon black mark buildup on the connectors, clean okay. that off gently with like a brass brush. All right. Um, that then go ahead, plug everything back in, turn the printer on, see if it'll come up to temp. Okay. I, the, if it if yeah. it doesn't, then okay, you're you're heating unit is is shot you're you're gonna have to replace that luckily those are also fairly cheap okay have you tried to power it back on yet or are you kind of afraid to um you know this is hard third hand and mm -hmm. yeah um because if if, think... if you do power it back on and, and like it just kind of arced at the thermistor you should get a thermistor error on, on your, mm -hmm. 
display yeah. board. And, and again, yeah. those are those are cheap. Even a whole hot end swap out is not that expensive, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. Under a hundred bucks. Um, she researched and I should have I was in the middle of something, so I didn't catch all the details. But um, mm -hmm. that it said that it may require uh, soldering. Mm -hmm. or it may uh, need to replace something or something. Well, so, I guess. so I guess the best thing to do would be if you could try for next week to have her send you a couple of pictures of the affected area. Okay. Uh, we, we could definitely help more easily diagnose if if we could see where that spark occurred yeah. um i can't really think of any place near the hot end that you would need to do any soldering of any kind yeah unless no uh, well i mean well okay so unless the connector itself got damaged and wherever she found, they're rec recommending that you solder on the new connector, which would give you the best connection, but crimping would be more than sufficient. Okay. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I would try to take some pics and, you know, yep. send them next week or uh, throw them out on Facebook. Um, you know, and we can get e yeah, either, a better you know, look at it. Yeah. Uh, that that that'd be my all right yeah you know i tried to gently ask her because she was already upset about it mm -hmm. uh, about did you think about turning the power off before you <laughs> get in there yeah it happens well yeah. she said um not that she needed the power on in order to tell if something was working, if the cleaning was working or something. I don't know what she said. Well, I mean, like, so, so for example, you know, if, if you want to change the nozzle out, you need to do that hot. I mean, really, yes, you, you can get it up to temp, turn it off, you know, change your nozzle, turn it back on. Right. Um, and it's, it's not going to drop temp that quickly. To, to affect it but you need to have it hot to do that okay oops i forgot to turn it off before i went to go do this oops i, I accidentally arced this right. well it, it 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 happens right yeah definitely have amanda bring um again she doesn't have to come obviously but if you had some more details of not only images but like of actually what happened you know, yeah. where where at and then you know if you can get pictures but exactly like brian said hopefully your worst case scenario is you just hundred hours yeah replace an entire hot end which to chris's point maybe your worst case scenario could be you replace the actual controller if, the if the controller board is damaged, um, Prusa is pretty damn good. You, you could probably say, hey, look, um, I was printing. Yeah, there's a warrant. Um, th 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 this is the symptom that I'm seeing, and they'll probably replace the board. Yes, you, you've got it within a year. Um, they have a one-year warranty. Even if you're beyond the one-year warranty, Prusa is very good about support. Yeah. Um, once you're past the one year, it just means it's not a, it's no longer a guarantee of them replacing it for you, uh, basically. And there wasn't anything um, nefarious about, you know, it, it wasn't like yeah. dumped a cup of coffee on it or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, you know, she was trying to get it back up again, and mm -hmm. you know, I feel for her because she's having all these problems, and all I can do is talk to her. You know, mm -hmm. that yeah. I can't be able to really see what's going on and mm -hmm. help and stuff. So we need to get you a Perusa so you can have the same mm -hmm. problem that she's having. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So I'm debating between the um, uh, 
the MK five S. Is it three Mark three S? Mark three yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, or waiting for the um, was it the Mark forty or something to come out? Oh yeah, either a Mark. I I haven't heard anything about a Mark four coming out because they've been working on the XL, which is the mm -hmm. four X Y line. XL. Yeah. That's what I was trying to think of. That you know gonna... that's like a that that's a whole nother animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the same but thing I... with what they did for the resin. That's a whole separate printing beast. The XL is a whole separate printing beast. You already know they're going to have an XL mini, right? Um, you know they'll, they'll have their uh, uh, Marlin style. I, you know I haven't heard I anything about a four point oh. I don't think that they are going to do a smaller form factor tool changer printer. Well, I, well, let me let me rephrase that. I agree with you. Yes, I think they would do a small form factor core XY that yes i i'm willing to bet they will do a smaller form factor core xy yes that yes, that they, i can see they will not do a multi tool changing for a um 11 inch bed or, or yeah or they're, a, they're you know a seven inch bed yeah no, no way but yeah so body, I would, if i were you i would i would just order a mk3s and the reason why i say that is because What's so nice about Perusa is not only the quality of their builds, as we know, that's why we, we had you get one of those, um, but for how everything is open source on their platforms. Right. Once they do come out with a 4.0 or, you know, instead of the three or MK3S, um, if anybody that had an MK3, they released either new 3D printed brackets or parts for people mm -hmm. to go and upgrade theirs. And sometimes if you bought it within a reasonable time, you know, that one-year warranty, say it's a new board or a new controller or something, they'll actually send you that brand new board because mm -hmm. you bought it within that time period. Right. Meaning, because it's open source and Perusa is just a good company, they will do their best to honor their older yeah. customers to have them keep up with the best tech, which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing, keep an eye out, like look on Facebook marketplace, um, for someone selling one. So, so for example, uh, down in the Florida area, I know a guy who just picked up a Mark three. I don't know if it was Mark three yes or not a plus or not. Um, but it, it was having some relatively easy to fix issues um it probably is cooling fan related might be the controller board but he got the whole mark three for like 250 bucks oh wow y yeah exactly so so yes there there is a known issue with it however even if he's got to buy a new controller board He's yeah. still gonna be, you know, maybe three hundred and fifty dollars into this printer, and he'll have a working Mark III. Right. So it, it's it's worth keeping an eye out. You know, you're not gonna see a screaming deal like that very often. Right. However, if if you're thinking about going down the Prusa path, it might not be a bad idea to to right. keep an eye out locally for that. You just might see one go for sale. Right. So I was thinking that if I get one, when I get one, I'll get the same that she has. And that way we can kind of parallel. Yes, that definitely makes it Good easier idea. to help each other troubleshoot. Yes, 100%. I agree. Good, good plan. <laughs> yes, definitely do that. I, I did the same thing for my mother when I bought her a new cell phone. She has the exact same phone that I do. It is so overkill for her. It's not even funny, but <laughs> it means if she ever has a question, right. I can walk her through it screen by screen because it's identical. Right. Yeah. yeah, you know exactly. And she knows exactly how it works after you've shown it to her three, four, five, six times. Oh, you are so she, she funny. Can... You are so funny. <laughs> right. 
I remember helping my grandma and, uh, you know, she had a, oh. she had an iPhone. I was showing her how to send like a Bitcoin transaction. She's like, Max, I'm not going to get this. I'm like, I know, yeah. so don't worry about it. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's yeah. I, or earlier this week, my, my mom's like, Hey, I have a phone number for you to add as a contact. I'm like, did they call you? Yeah. Okay. Go, go to your phone. Yeah. Hey, yeah. like hit the big plus side. <laughs> oh, you showed me this before, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I did. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all, all in due time. You got to help out your mother. <laughs> yep. 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 So. All right, guys. What else you got before we go? And, um, anything? Um, anything other things that we need to think of grabbing for us for next week, Bonnie? You know, we got pictures, you know, what else? I'll ask her to do, I like bullet points or whatnot. E- e- yes. E- yeah. Get, get, a, get a short description of what she was doing just before the spark. Yeah. Right. Pictures of where the spark happened and anything she has done since the spark happened. Like, has she tried unplugging things, plugging them back in? Has she tried turning it on? You know, th- yeah. things like that. Right. Okay. Yeah, we'll give it a shot. Uh, also, uh, also, real quick, see if she has a multimeter. She, her boyfriend does. Okay, okay good. Because that will definitely help with going through and testing some of the components to, to know if they're good or need to be replaced. Right. He'll try to help her with it this weekend. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's so ha- have them have them get the multimeter out and test the resistance for both the the hot end as well as the thermistor. Okay. Um, the, I don't know what the correct values should be, but Prusa should have those published. Okay. Um. And if they're wildly different than that, yeah, just, okay, that component's done. Go count that one as a replace. Right. Yeah, that, yeah that, that's a cool topic to help out. So, yeah, see what so, she comes back with, and uh, we'll go from there and see if we can help you out. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really hope this is the last hurdle because, <laughs> you know, yeah. she's, She's really struggled with things that you would think would be simple, but she mm-hmm. also understands that she's cutting her teeth on this. You know that this. Yeah. We're starting out learning something. You go through things like this, and it. Yep. You know, she's not the only one, so mm-hmm. that kind of helps her a little bit to realize all that. Yeah. Now, Brian, have you done a lot of printing with silk? filament um because i've heard no. uh, okay so i've heard from from grant who he he has i think almost 40 printers at this point mm-hmm. um all all most all prusas by the way nice. silk filaments can be a right pain in the ass because yeah. just like white filament it will show every single imperfection in your print yeah um i have some silk silver that i really like um mm -hmm. and i've had good results with it um okay but it's not it's not what i normally buy and you know use on a daily basis Mm -hmm. the other thing for silk filament don't you have to print it a little bit hotter as well Uh, i i don't i print it the same as all the other pla okay Yeah, I didn't. I, I, I haven't. Yeah, oh, I haven't she, monkeyed with any settings on it. And she just used both the mat, if that's the right term, um, mm-hmm. and the silk, and mm-hmm. has been able to do both. But oh, okay. now she can't seem to move from one to the other. Okay. Um, and she seems to be having trouble with the height that um, it. She was trying to print a frame, 
Mm -hmm. I know that can be its own challenge, but that it would kind of peel up a little bit, even though she uh, did a raft. Okay. So, I don't know. One day she'll get it nailed, I hope. Mm -hmm. But right now, Mm -hmm. (laughs) she's not there. It just it just continues to ring in my head, Brian, on how important a not only a you know like a twenty four hour Amazon you know kind of business to get you a new hot end, right? You know, oh yeah, hey, jam, you know, not a problem. You know, you, it's a it's a fifteen dollar a month program. You get a brand new hot end, right? You ship it in, done, right? Looks like a new hot new hot end for that machine is like fifty seven dollars. But the problem is you can't even order them because it's the same issue that automotive yeah. companies have. Perusa won't even sell you a hot end because they can't even fulfill the orders for the overall machines which come yeah. with hot end. So why should I try to double my capacity on hot ends if I can't even fulfill the full printer orders, let alone a second or a third hot end option, right? You're, that's where, yeah. again, what's so nice about being open source, you go and buy your own e, uh, E3D um, chassis, and then you go and buy your aftermarket heater block and your thermistor and stuff like that. And then you hook it up to your Perusa. You know, yeah, I Perusa. mean, there's, there's definitely a million hot end clones out there um, on Amazon, most of them are reasonably decent clones. Some, you know, not so much, but at least for like a simple machine part like that, I mean, yeah, they're they're pretty easily available. 